very excited and very uh, privileged to have Dan Kajima joining us today. So for those of you that don't know Dan, Dan, uh, you're a 14-year agent, is that right? Correct me if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. 14-year agent. Uh, he's been with Farmers for 14 years, came from a different insurance company and you know joined Farmers and has been pretty much killing it ever since. So we're very excited to have you on board, very excited to, to learn from you and see what you've done to grow your agency, but also what you would do if you were an agent today and let's say you were a smaller agency and how you would uh, take the next steps to, get, to find growth and you know take it to the next level as an agency owner. So thank you again very much for joining us. You know, I, I thought we would structure today kind of like a Q&A session. You know, um, I sent you some questions that I think would be great for us to cover. And then obviously if anybody else has any questions, uh, feel free to have them unmute themselves or you know chat the questions in so we can, we can uh, get those answered for them. But again, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your support and uh, your willingness to help like always. Yeah, no, thank you, Wilbur, for having me on. I remember uh, we worked on a national sales, um, like a presentation, and me and yeah. you were on stage. So that that they really went really well. Um, so it's always a pleasure working with you, Wilbur, and congratulations to your success in your district too. So yeah, I, like I said, I'm really looking forward to uh, trying to help out and bring as much value as I can to your agents. Awesome, well, again, thank you. So uh, I thought we'd start today off uh, you know, just by getting a little background on you. So, you know, tell us a little bit about you, yourself, your agency, kind of your path, you know, uh, what your agency looks like a little bit and kind of what, what got you to this level. Uh, just real quick for, for, for those of you on the call, you know, Dan is, uh, how much PIF? Do you, I know last time we talked, you were over 10,000 PIF. I'm not sure where you stand today. Yeah, I think I'm pretty close to uh, 1,100 now. Uh, I mean, 11,000 now. Uh, so um, we're almost there. That's awesome. And I know last month you had a record-breaking uh, sales month with over 740 policies issued. Is that right? Well, month. I think that's a little bit of, um, it's 740 new business count, you know? So uh, when it comes to policies, I'm not sure, but you know, when you sell like a three car policy it counts as three counts. It's a little, maybe a little bit different, but that is uh, our all time best month. So uh, we are going still headed the right direction and I'm really excited about the opportunity farmers gives us. And then really proud of my team for, um, you know, because, um, yeah, out of all those policies, um, I think last month I, I didn't sell one, a single one. <laughs> so That's awesome. I'm not sure if I'm bragging or, or it's embarrassing. Now you got a great team. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so really proud of them and really grateful for them as well. And that's, I think, what a lot of our agency owners want to get to, uh, right, is becoming more of that business owner. You know, how do I make sure my agency is still thriving and writing policies without me being the one that's selling them day to day, right? So, uh, yeah, that, that is definitely a cross uh, path that every agent gets to, you know, and they make that hard decision of, hey, you know, what is my duty going to change, uh, become? Uh, but uh, that is a difficult, uh, a big momentum shift or a big moment in the agency's owner's life is when that shift happens. So I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Awesome. We're looking forward to it. So, yeah, if you want to just real quickly touch on your background and kind of a little bit about your agency and how you got started. Yeah, sure. So um, right out of college, I knew I wanted to do a commission job because I was into sales. I was selling sneakers at a sporting goods store and I was making, you know, I understood that, hey, if I perform better than even though I was making working part time, you know, we're all in been in sales. Uh, I'm pretty sure before our career started. So I was in sales uh, at triple at, right after college. I, I got a job at AAA. Uh, it was a call center. So I got some experience there. Well, I got licensed there and I learned how to sell insurance over the phone. Uh, you know, phone calls were coming in and I did really well there. Um, and that didn't work out um, at the end after three years. So, um, you know, I became a farmer's insurance agent because the opportunity was there. Um, and then that was 2007. And then it's been just, you know, every small step, you know, there's a lot of uh, difficult times. And uh, um, I don't think over it's, I might have to correct you if you say I was killing it from the beginning <laughs> because uh, a lot of difficult days, a lot of difficult months, you know, sometimes challenging enough where I just questioned myself of what I was doing. But, you know, I kept at it 14 years later. Um, and it's been a steady progress. You know, it hasn't been like one year that really just shifted everything. It's just been really gradual. So I think patience is going to be the key uh, key theme to a, a lot of what I talk about. But right now. Uh, went to... Um, you know, now a, a book of business is 13 million. Uh, it's uh, 11,000 PIF. I have uh, 12 staff members 
and looking to expand, you know, so that's where we're at right now. But um, I'm, I'm more excited than ever now, you know, ho hoping to looking at new office spaces right now um, and, you know, recruiting daily, training daily and looking at new uh, marketing uh, strategies daily. Uh, so those are the type of things I'm doing now. And I feel like uh, um, I'm still only getting started after 14 years. I'm still very excited. I work as hard as it. I work harder now than I ever have, to be honest with you, because it's just more fun now. Um, and um, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. And that's um, hopefully where I'm headed. That's awesome, man. I mean, I, I know that you're always growing. You're, like you said, you work hard, harder now than probably ever. I, I follow you on social media, you know, Facebook and Instagram, and I see all your posts. I see you at the office. I see you also doing a lot of self-development. You know, I, I know that you read a lot of books that I think put you in the right, in the right frame of mind to help make sure that you're, that you're thinking about growth and not just being complacent. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think when it comes to this business, I mean, we're so blessed that we get residual income. And that's a blessing and a curse at times. So even though we have the residual income and, you know, there's a lot of delayed gratification that's working for me right now, uh, I think it is important to stay at, ahead of the curve and see what's ne coming next because that's what keeps me excited. And I think that's a personal choice that I, all agency owners have. But I personally like staying busy. I'm here at 7.30 in the morning before anybody else gets here and I leave at 7.30 at night after everybody leaves at 7. Um, but I'm really excited and pumped up about, you know, how much potential this business has. Once I started realizing that, it gives me even more fuel and more energy to, um, you know, see uh, what we're able to accomplish. That's awesome. So I have a next question for you, and this is, this is probably going to be a really long, I assume a, a kind of a multi-part answer to this question. But, you know, you mentioned you got about 1,000, uh, I'm sorry, 11,000 PIF, $1.3 million in premium. How did you grow your agency to the level where it's at now? You know, what steps did you take to get to, to get there? Well, um, it did start off with internet leads. You know, I think uh, we talked about it, Wilbur, but, you know, day two of starting my agency, I started buying internet leads because I was so, that, that's back in 2007 too. So, I mean, everybody at the district office where I was working at was calling me and they were trying to like, they're trying to be nice, telling me like, hey, you know, don't do that because you're going to waste your money. Um, they were looking out for me, really. I think it came from a good place, but I was just so desperate for action. You know, I was working at AAA and I was having people to talk to and I was used to closing people over the phone. And I, I just came into the office and there was literally nobody to talk to. So I had to buy leads. That's what started uh, my journey. Um, and things have evolved. And I think that is going to happen to everybody on this call here where, you know, what gets you to a certain point isn't what's going to get you to the next level. You know, so that is kind of what I did for, uh, and I still do it at, at some levels today by inner leads. But in general, you know, it's all for me, and, and this is just for me, and it's, it's different for everybody. It should be different for everybody. But for me, the digital marketing has worked out. So now I'm on to, you know, not only inner leads, but trying to generate my own leads, whether it be social media or uh, Google AdWords. So those are the type of things I'm working on now. But, you know, I think every step of the way, I learned something. And every step of the way, I do remember just not being good at that. But, you know, it's, it's the difficult things that we do is what gets us to the next level. So even though I wasn't good at things in the beginning and I was just willing to not be good, I guess, and probably, frankly, to lose some money uh, because, um, you know, I think I talked about it, Wilbur, before too uh, on stage with you, but... I was uh, playing poker um, before I started my agency and I was playing pretty high stakes poker. And I, I think at that time, I pretty much learned that, hey, you have to risk a little bit of money to make money. So the willingness to learn, the willingness to lose, I think those are some of the things that took me to the next level each time. Same thing with employees, you know, spending money on it, risking, you know, and making investments when it comes to staffing and marketing. Uh, those are the things if I look back, are the moves that I made that helped me get to the next level every single time. Usually it was some type of marketing campaign or uh, a new hire that really helped me. So, and, it, and again, it just took a long time to get here. Um, but if you're headed towards the right direction, uh, even though it will take time, um, it does make a difference over long periods of time if you're taking the right actions every day. I thought that's a great answer. I do have a question. We didn't talk about this before, but I just thought of it while you were talking. 
Um, is there anything that if you could go back, you know, 14 years ago, is there anything different that you would do over the last 14 years? Anything that you do that you would have done differently? Um, that's a good question, Wilbur. I think everything's a learning experience. I don't really have that many regrets. But, you know, I, I would think that if I have a good marketing system or a campaign, and for you guys too, if you guys have something that's working, I would have gone, and I, even though people will say you're pretty aggressive, I feel like I should have been even more aggressive. Because sometimes you get lease vendors and stuff like that, or lead providers or campaigns, they're hot for a while and then they'll go cold and you have to look for another one and you have to like always search for the next like marketing idea. But if something's working, I should have I should have put more money into it. You know, because I think there was a little bit of hesitation of like, is this gonna be a good ROI or is this gonna be good? You know, it's like, oh, this is going great, but let me look for another source. And then, you know, being really spread thin with like so many different marketing activities. I would have, I think if I had something and also the budget too, like for some reason, I just had a cap, like oh, I can't spend X amount of dollars per month on marketing. You know, I should have not thought of that way. And just, if something's working, just put more money into it while it's hot. And I think I would have been uh, taken advantage or shifted to different marketing campaigns a little bit sooner. So, um, you know, looking for a marketing campaign that works is difficult enough or lead vendor that works well is hard enough but when you find something to even be more aggressive um i think is something that maybe i could have done a little bit more okay oh, that's great advice so when you find something that's working really well double down on that and making sure that you can get as, as much uh, i guess juice out of that lemon as you can right exactly yeah that sounds that, that's good advice um how did you how did you or how do you work leads um right now like let's say a lead comes in what does that, that work uh, plan look like? I know your leads are a little bit different now. You generate a lot of your own leads as well. But uh, if we're talking just regular internet leads, what does that workflow look like for your agency? Yeah, whether you uh, you generate your own leads or your purchase leads, I think the workflow is going to be pretty much the same. You know, So we give them a call and we email them and we text them. So all three. And uh, we have a... Um, uh, CRM or lead organizing, you know, s system. I, I use Infusion Shops, but it's a little bit advanced. That so that's like creating a whole new system that's all customizable. So there's no templates built in. So that took a long time for me to develop. Uh, but you know, agency Zoom or um, you know Apex. Um, I should say that <laughs> uh, MVP. There's, you gotta have some type of automated system that follows up with them with emails and text messages. Text messages is, is huge. A uh, great way to uh, increase your contact rate and communicate with people. And I just feel like that's just the way customers perform, uh, prefer to be contacted you know, rather than giving them a bunch of times. You know, so many phone calls you give them and it just becomes a little annoying or, you know, a little desperate. So my strategy is to really try to get them to call us. And to do that, it's really great when we have automated emails and texts getting sent out so they can contact us whenever they feel like it. Uh, so that's kind of like the strategy, you know, sometimes I feel like my producers are getting a little spoiled and like, are they even giving them a call at all? <laughs> so I'm like, Can I call your leads, at least call them, geez, you know, but uh, when it comes to automation, that's really something that I highly recommend having. And even if it wasn't automated, I will, I will still send out more emails than ever, send out texts, you know, you could do that for the first 90 days. So send out texts um, and then... With, with options to opt out, obviously, both of them. So we want to make okay. sure we're following compliance. But um, those are the, the methods that has worked really well for us. And when it comes to emails, even after 90 days, you can still do that. So you could have a drip campaign and, you know, some of the older leads you'll be converting later on. So really, um, uh, that's, what I, that's what I do. Um, other than that, we just put notes in the system and uh, we follow up. I kind of let my producers choose on how they want to follow up with them. But um, I think the most important thing is just how fast we text them, email them, and then how consistent we do that. And there's a there's a game to play there too, you know, because you could be too aggressive even with text, especially with text, and they'll unsubscribe. So you have to balance it out and check your data and see, you know, if you send out too many or if you change the copy. So those are the type of things I'm thinking about as far as marketing when it comes to, okay, how frequent, what type of language should we use? And uh, what are the ones that convert into contacts, you know, the lead into a quote uh, and things like that is um, 
what I'm always thinking about right now. And it's, it's really actually fun to see, you know, different tweaks or different wordings or different emails and what pictures work, what uh, subject of the emails works. Those are the things that I'm working on that actually uh, small, different, small changes can make a big difference in the long run. Okay, awesome. So how much of your marketing right now is, is new leads as opposed to remarketing, let's say, leads that you've acquired over the last 14 years? Um, man, that's a good, great question. I, th I think um, it's 80% or well, of the new business sales because we get referrals and cross sales and you know rewrites and things like that too. Um, so that kind of plays into play with the 740 uh, you know, new business count that we got. But the old leads still, there's a lot of value there, you know, but mostly it's through email. And the great thing is, is that it's automated. So it doesn't require like a physical staff member, you know, because I don't even think we're allowed to call them or text them, you know. So but the emails, you know, they just go get sent out at once a month um, until they unsubscribe and people will, you know, click on that and um, fill out forms and things like that. So I think um, it's just so worth it because once you have the system set up, it's just running on its own, but I would think like, you know, 20% of the new business, pure new business sales we get is from, you know, the older bees that we have. Okay. Interesting. Now you've, you've kind of been talking a little bit about um, a lot of texting, a lot of emailing and really, you haven't really mentioned phone calls. Already. You basically said that you're not even sure if some of your producers are calling some of your leads, um, which is basically the opposite of everything I hear from most other agencies that, that work a lot of leads. Um, you know, most of the agents I talked to, you know, I was talking to, I think, Jennifer Meyer uh, about a month ago, who was also personalized agent of the year. And I think she, she has her staff call people six times a day. I want to say, I want to say for 14 days. Um, can you explain, I guess, did, were you always that way? Were you, were you called very little and then just a lot of text and email or did you evolve to that point? I kind of evolved to that point. I think, you know, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, and that works for her because her numbers are, you know, humongous, but I think it kind of depends on where we live, you know, like, I think it's like, personally, I just think that like, even if a friend calls me, I'm just like, dude, why are you calling me? You know, like what's going on? Like what? Like just text me. Like, I'm just like, when you get a phone call, it's just like expecting someone to abruptly stop what they're doing and take your call and focus on me, you know? So, so, so my strategy is more, Hey, just call me when it's convenient for you. We're open from eight to seven. C call us whenever it's convenient for you. And instead of like, you know, I just don't want to have the sense of desperation. So when I feel like we text and then they call us and then we say, hey, you know, thank you for calling farmers. They're like, hey, yeah, I want to quote. It just puts my producers in a much better selling atmosphere than them calling and calling and calling. Like, hey, can I get a, they're like, okay, fine. Well, I'll give you a chance. And it's just, I, I just feel like the closing ratio and then also, frankly, their job duty is more enjoyable when people are getting calls rather than them having to call out all the time. And it's, I think it's a more sustainable job, too, because, man, it's not it's not easy to be a telemarketer in California these days. <laughs> like people yeah. just don't appreciate it, you know, and I think it's not a great way to start a relationship when you're just bugging the heck out of them. But um, you know, I talk, I talked to other agents in different States and they have crazy telemarketing practices and they say it works, but they have told me that, Hey, my system doesn't work in California. It's just, I think just depends on where you live. Uh, certain areas are more open to getting calls and talking. And I just feel like maybe Californians aren't just that nice <laughs> in general when it comes to, um, you know, uh, getting called and getting spam with phone calls. Uh, so it really depends, but, uh, there's so many different ways to go about this, but I'm just sharing you my way. I yeah. think the most important thing is for each, each agent to test things out, not be scared to do it their way that they, you know, intuitively think will work, putting themselves in their customer's shoes and testing it out, you know, try to six calls a day and see if there's, you know, value into that or if the prospects are appreciate that, but try, you know, uh, every a text every day for six days in a row, you know, see which one's better. Um, and I think it's really uh, ultimately up to the market to decide which works better. So can you share how many texts you, you send to a customer right now? Or, I'm sorry, for a new lead. So you get a new lead. Mm -hmm. How many texts and emails do they get, let's say, in the first month? Uh, in the first month? Well, it gets 
in the, in the beginning, it's a little bit more, in, not intense, but it's more frequent. So in, instantaneously, they get a text from the office and from the producer. And the next day, they get a text from the uh, both again. And then so two texts uh, at once. Uh, and then so two texts, one each from the office number and from the producer themselves. Second day, same thing. And then third day, just from the producer. We take the fourth day off. And then the fifth day, we'll send a text. And then it goes every other day to like once a week. So... Uh, um, I guess we'll about 10 texts for the first month, but maybe like 14 texts, but over half of that is done within the first 10 days. And then it just gets less and less uh, as the, the month goes on. For example, like the last two weeks, we'll probably text them like twice total. Okay. You know, are your texts geared towards having a conversation via text or is it more like you're trying to get them to call you back? A good question. Yeah, it's it's geared towards more um, the setup appointment. Okay. To talk. And when's a good time for you to talk about your options, coverage, and discounts? Because when you fall into that game of like, okay, you want to text, you want to quote, and they're like, yes, and then you just ask because you, you could technically do that, but there's really you give them the price and the conversation just ends right there. But you didn't have a chance to like talk about why coverage is important or you know. Uh, if they own a rent, there's just so many like, you know, things that is so important with our product that we have to have a consultative sales approach that we just really can't sell through text. So I highly recommend, or that's what I do with my producers and the messages is like, when's a good time for you? And try to set up appointments. So that way they're in, okay, um, I blocked this time off to talk about insurance with you. So that's what you want to kind of set up is appointments. Okay. Do you have a goal of how many appointments you want to set each day? No, not really. I mean, that's a great, um, that's a great, but appointments are turning into quotes, you right. know? So the quote, how many people we quoted is a goal. Um, but I um, don't really look at it that closely. I, I just feel, because I'm in the office all the time. I just want, the goal is for every producer to be busy on the phones. So I kind of go off feel more than like how many quotes they did. Uh, but right now I think we're averaging about 50 quotes a day. Um, and we want to get that, that number higher. And to do that, it's all about, you know, just recruiting, training, and, um, you know, getting producers ready. Because once you have a new producer, that means you're able to do more quotes. Of course. So now that you're about producers and recruiting and training, you know, how do you, how do you recruit the staff? How do you pay them? How does it, what does the conversation look like? Yeah, sure. Um, my method has always been, you know, look for just, great people with attitude and great attitude and great activity work ethic. So I'm not sure about you guys, but it's very difficult to find somebody who's already licensed and ready to go. Uh, so here I play the long game where I'll hire somebody with uh, a base salary, base hourly pay of, you know, 16 to $18 an hour, depending on their, you know, uh, situation. And then, um, for the first, you know, so it's very intro level position in the beginning. Um, maybe like secretary or administrative work, assistant type work, you know, data entry, um, you know, chatting with farmers, calling um, cancellation lists. And then, you know, they move on to customer service where they're, you know, taking calls. But, you know, a lot of sales support. So after about six months, then I'll get them licensed. You know, so when I hire them, I tell them, hey, your goal is to get licensed. If you do really well, I'll get you licensed. So I already gave them the mindset of like, hey, if you do, you know, there's a career path. First, you're a secretary, then you become a, a customer service, then you become a producer. So in about six months, hopefully they pass their test right away. Everything goes smoothly. But right then, that doesn't mean they get leads either, you know, because they're still new. So now you got to, you know, sell to your natural market, try to get some um, referrals, um, cross-sell our existing book, um, and do FFRs, things like that. And then if they're showing promise, you know, then they start getting leads because leads is a huge expense for me. So I'm not going to just buy it and give it to somebody brand new. Uh, so they have to earn their, earn their way up to getting leads. So that's kind of the career path. Um, and then my compensation plan is just 10% of new business. So um, six months auto, it's six, whatever 10% of that is. And then if it's an annual policy, whatever 10% of the premium of that. So I, t I like to keep it simple. There's no like tiers or anything like that. There's no uh, renewals. 
uh, very simple. So it's the hourly, which could you know go up as as uh, agents here um, do well uh, and help help me out with other things such as training. Um, and then um, yeah, the commission is uh, that, and I'm really blessed. You know, I love my team. I have uh, people here uh, coming up almost ten years now. I have uh, about four or five people, four or five team members that's been here for over five years. Um, so um, yeah, employee retention is, is is key. It's so important to grow a business, and I think the compensation plan is, is part of it, but there's a lot of other parts that determine how well you can recruit, hire, train, and retain your staff. So you mentioned 10%. So is that 10% of the premium or the agency uh, commissions? That's 10% of premium. So if it's like a $1,000 uh, six months auto policy, then they get a hundred bucks. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah, that's more than 9%, right? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> pay more than, than your agency actually makes on, on auto insurance. Yeah. And they get paid hourly and, you know, I'm pay paying for the leads, but um, it works out. It, it, it works out in the long game. And that's what agency owners were in, in for. The producers are in it for the short game. Right. They care about their next check. You know, uh, we care about, you know, our folios two, three years from now. So, uh, and, and, you know, some of these bonuses the farmers has for the new business, you know, uh, numbers uh, definitely help out too. Um, but I, I believe in paying producers upfront. Um, and then, you know, cross our fingers and hope they keep renewing. That makes sense. Yeah. And obviously it's, it's worked out for you, right? Because you have a pretty large book that you now get to reap the benefits of each month. Yeah. And I think that keeps our producers, um, you know, excited, motivated because they could have some pretty big months, you know? Um, and I think that's also important in Southern California to have a sales position, you know, that has high income potential over six figures. I think to be able to do something like that, then you need to have a compensation plan that, you know, gives them the potential to do that. Uh, so 10% is something that I've am able to do. And based on, you know, like the summer jaw, I'm able to just really go crazy on that. Uh, so really appreciate any type of uh, initiatives farmers gives us because it's not easy to sell insurance and to motivate your producers, they have to be, you know, um, not paid well, but they have to have the opportunity to make a good living being a good insurance producer. Right. They have, they have to be able to earn good money, right? Yeah. You give them that opportunity. Plus you give them the, the leads. So you give them the ability to do it. Um, how, what do you do as far as training? I, I know that I've seen some, some of your, your uh, videos with, uh, with um, Craig Wiggins and also with, with Jeremy Olson. Do you use their systems or what do you use to train and develop your team? Yeah, I just started Jeremy's system recently. I think his system is very uh, is awesome. I love it. Uh, but you know, still in general, I think that's what I do most of the time. So that's kind of like my duty. You know, like I kind of, we were kind of laughing about how little I sold, but man, how much I train is like pretty much all I do. You know, so that's what I that's really where I stay busy. We're really involved in, um, you know, I sit really out in the cubicles with them. You know, so everybody's, uh, I'm right in the middle of the office too. So I can hear somebody if they have a question, I'm available. So, you know, if hopefully eventually I can replace myself in that role. But at, at the level I'm at right now, my career right now, I am very, uh, that's like my number one duty is to be available to them and to help out with any questions they have. And if they sales doesn't go well, or if they're not following up or if they're not updating the CRM, like just those are the type of things I'm doing, you know. So training is the number one job that I have right now. Um, and um, it's really important because, you know, I'm trying to build a team and to have capable producers. I just can't really expect them to just watch a few videos and to learn and then do it on their own time I, or, you know, call farmers or chat with them. I have to be available and really tell them, you know, how to do things because um, uh, that's my kind of like my obligation as their employer to like train them how to be good at, you know, insurance sales or customer service. Right, give that live feedback, right? Interactive feedback as they're yeah. doing the job. That makes sense. Exactly. So I had somebody chat in a question. What do you do when your producers aren't performing? When do you pull the cord? Well, uh, I have reviews every three months, but that's sometimes not frequent enough. But if they're not producing, I, I kind of look at it as, okay, obviously it's good to sit down with them, you know, talk. But a lot of times 
I find that, you know, unless you have multiple producers, you could tell that really, you know, agent A is so much better than agent B. But at certain times, I think earlier in my career, I felt like, oh, they're not doing well. What's wrong with them? I think I kind of shifted that focus to like, what am I not doing right? You know, and then kind of taking accountability and saying, hey, am I not getting enough leads? You know, am I not training you? Is your compensation not motivating enough? Like, what do I need to do to make them producers do better? If you have two producers and one of them is doing great and the other one's not, then, you know, you want to think, what am I not doing for that particular agent? Like, what's what am I not doing? And really see what you could do for them to get their numbers up. So it's not more, it's less than like, hey, you got to get your sales numbers up or, you know, you're going to get fired. It's more like, hey, what am I not doing for you? Like, what's wrong? Like, how am I not providing value for you to, to be able to close leads? You know, and having more of that type of conversation where you really want to help them uh, eventually turns out the better results for me rather than, hey, I want to pull a plug if you can't sell or have quotas and things like that. I don't have quotas. Um, I'm more of, what do we need to do? What do I need to do for you to help you sell more policies? So it's definitely uh, a team game when it comes to producer and uh, the agency owner. And I think sitting down and talking and trying to figure out what you could do for them, give that a try first. Uh, and if you've done everything, you know, if they can't sell, then I move them into more of a customer service or training role. That has happened to me multiple times because there's so many things in the agency that brings value. If you can't, if you're not a great salesperson, you can still help us out. So I wouldn't really still pull the plug. Really, the only time I would pull the plug is I'm getting bad attitude or just bad work ethic. Those are the only two things that could really make me to fire somebody, which I've done multiple times in the past. But for not being able to sell, I wouldn't pull the plug because if they have a good attitude, they have a good work ethic, they can help out. They, they, could, they could still get better or we could find a little different role for them within the agency. So the number one thing you're looking for is their personality, their attitude. If they have that attitude and they're willing to get better, you, you kind of find out what you can do to help and develop them. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, really. You know, I, I feel like that's how much, you know, confidence I have in my leads and my uh, training and um, what I bring to them. So it just does take time. But if they have a good, you know, people don't, their attitudes or their outlook in life or their work ethic, that doesn't increase that much. That's kind of how they come. So I want to make sure I have a good foundation and then I build up upon top of that. That makes sense. You know, and then it does take time, but, you know, time is what else we're going to do. You know, we're going to be working and growing our agencies, you know, five, 10 years from now, might as well, you know, just plant a seed and let it grow uh, because um, I'd rather have something that's sustainable for the long term than a producer that's ready to go right away. But, you know, um, doesn't work out in six months. That's just, at the end of the day, I think that ends up being more work. So I like to start them with no experience and just, you know, work our way slowly into uh, making them successful in the insurance agents, insurance business. And I think that way you do get a little bit more uh, loyalty and more production out of them. You know, if they, mm-hmm. if they don't know anything about insurance, you help them what liability means, understand what liability means. You got them licensed and you just um, really what was there for them when they needed help. You trained them. And then, um, you know, now they're doing well in the insurance business. Then I think um, the loyalty and even the work ethic even steps up even more because you were able to, you know, deliver for them first. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for that feedback. Um, I had a few more questions get chatted in. Um, what level and how did you bust through some of the plateaus you've had? One question. So I guess when you reach a plateau, what do you do to get to that next level? I guess is what that question is asking. Um, for me, it's been increasing marketing spend. You know, if you hit, hit a plateau and you're like, hmm, I can't get to the next level, you know, it's like a lot of times it's like, hey, I just have to spend more money on marketing or staffing. You know, so uh, I can't sell more than 100 policies per month. I was just like, well, if I, it, just, it just became such a simple formula where if I spend more, then I sell more. You know, so once I got to that point, I was like, why, why am I not spending more? You know, like, what, what, is, what is the fear? Or like, why is it that I can't justify spending more? Sometimes you talk to other agents and, you know, you tell them your marketing budget. like, oh, my God, so much. And you kind of start thinking like, oh, am I spending too much on marketing? You know, so I got into my own, I, I, got, I got, you know, really try to figure out like how come I can't get to the next level when I have the marketing systems, when I have, you know, the staff 
that's hungry. It was just simply the problem of not having enough lead volume. So when I just started spending more money on leads, even though, it, yeah, that kind of sucks because of my compensation plan, I'm spending more and then I'm paying more commission. Yeah, initially, it actually, you're making less money. But, you know, I don't really have that high of a personal need. You know, I have a family and, um, you know, we're living in beautiful uh, Southern California, Irvine. And, you know, we have, um, we don't, you don't need that, that much, <laughs> you know? So it's <laughs> like, if I have extra money in the bank, then might as well make it put to use and use that. So, you know, there's future revenue coming in and you're growing your asset, which is your book of business. So once I figured that out, I think every plateau I got to, I was like, okay, well, it's, it's going to seem a little scary, but just spend more money, you know? So I think that is, um, the answer to um, breaking out of a flat plateau. Awesome, that's a great way. Um, if, if you don't mind me ask, asking, what is your marketing budget these days? So yeah, my marketing budget right now is a um, uh, little over 35,000 a month. Wow, awesome. Which yeah, and I remember months? last time you asked me that, it was like 18,000, that was only a couple of years ago. So I have been making a little bit more of an adjustment because you know it's been a little bit challenging to get leads these days but even at those numbers i think it's still worth it um and uh it's just more fun to be busy to be recruiting hiring staying busy breaking personal records um but you know i, I do remember for some reason way back in the days when i was like i can't spend more than ten thousand per month that's crazy you know, like I was stuck at 10,000. I wouldn't let myself go over that. And once I said, no, that's fine. Let's just go to the next level. That's when things started. And then um, what else was I add to that? Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I was, it might have been something important, but uh, probably not. <laughs> if you think of it, bring it, bring it back up. <laughs> but but yeah, I do remember having that conversation, and I think I, I I've talked to you a long long time ago. I, I remember you mentioned that, that ten thousand dollar number, and then yes, at, at the national sales league you mentioned eighteen thousand. But the fact that you're at thirty five thousand now, I mean, less than that's about two years two years now. I mean, basically double that number in two years is, is amazing. Now, obviously, like you said, you, you continue build, beating your own personal records. I feel like every other month you you've had your best month ever. When, when I follow you on Instagram and, and Facebook, which is amazing to see. It's really awesome to see your growth and your premium because with that, it's not like you're small, writing just only small policies. It's a little bit of everything, right? And I think you're driving really good premium, which helps you pay for the, that marketing budget. And then with the bonuses and the residual income, it, it all pencils out and you make a profit again on the, on the long game, right? Yep. Yep. That's exactly it. Wilbur. Yeah. It's all about the long game for me, you know, uh, it's not about the next folio. It's more about hey, what's going to help me, you know, two, three, five, ten years from now, fifteen years from now. What what are the moves to make now? It's all about you know delay gratification and uh, making paying the pace, paying the price right now, so you can have a better future for you, uh, your family, and your staff's uh, family uh, down the line. Yeah, that makes sense. So I had another question, a couple a couple more questions chatted in. Um, so I know that. You don't have a, a quota for your producers, but do you have a goal for your producers each month? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the goal is, is based on them. So I don't have a goal myself for them. I sit down with them and say, hey, what's your goal? You know, and whatever their goal is, I want to write 25,000, I want to write 50,000. That kind of tells me their ambitious, ambition level, how much work they're ready, ready to put in. So I don't want to force somebody who doesn't want to do that awesome, you know, everybody has their situation and their work ethic level. And, you know, if they want to work Saturdays, there's just so many different variables with each person's ambition. So I kind of, you know, okay, you want to write 25,000. Okay. I'm thinking we, I should probably get you this much leads. Okay. And I'm thinking that you're going to have this type of roles. This is what you're going to be doing. And I just try my best to help them accomplish their goals. So it's, it's, Rather than me setting it for them, I have them them set it for themselves, and I try my best to ha have those goals come true. I do try to push them to like, hey, your goals are a little low. Let's increase it. So I'll do a little bit of that. Um, but you know, producers in general aren't going to be as motivated as you, and that's going to be totally okay. You know, but you do want to gauge how motivated they are, 
and you want to help them stay motivated, I think that's a huge job as an agency owner that's underrated is to really make them believe in themselves mm -hmm. and know they're capable for more. I think that's a huge job that we have is to let, you know, so if they have self-confidence, it's a great start, but uh, whatever their goals, and not only premium goals or sales count goals or whatever, I like to talk about really like their future real goals. Like what do they want to do financially? Yeah. Yeah. I saw one of your, one of your top producers just bought a house not too long ago. Right. So I assume you probably had conversations about them buying a house and you help them get to the revenue that they needed to get that house. Is my assumption. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really it. Well, we're, you know, we've talked about that, you know, every, you know, three months, every review uh, for a long time, you know? So that's, that's why it was like a, even like, emotional moment for me when she was able to accomplish that because that was like not just her goals but that's like my goal you know and i just had a, a agent earlier this year that was able to do that to a, a condo but she was able to purchase a house too uh but um yeah think about what their goals are and if you help them accomplish their, sometimes they don't even know what their goals are until you really ask them too so you, you even go through that self-discovery their discovery phase of like what's really motivating it and understanding what their why is just asking them, making them do that practice of finding that out is already value. So they're like, okay, this is really why I want to work so much or why I really want to work and why money is important. And then we work towards that goal together. And if you're able to accomplish that, then I think um, you're really making a difference in someone's life. And once you bring that type of value to somebody, then you get work ethic, loyalty, and just, you know, all the good stuff comes in return. That makes sense. So what would you say is a good goal that like, you would be okay with? So I know you mentioned sometimes you try to coach them up a little bit. What would be a goal that, that I guess, kind of like a minimum goal that you expect out of, out of your producer's, you know, motivation and desire? Well, again, it just depends on um, how many leads you're providing them. You know, so you can have like, hey, write 10,000 in premium, but if you're not sending them any leads, unless you have a pretty big, big business and you're able to do FFRs all day long, that might be still hard. So um, I like to start off with 10,000, but literally somebody, get, some of my producers here that just got their license, they get to 10,000, it's like, wow, great job. You did that with like barely no leads, you know? Whereas somebody could be writing 25,000, it's like, ah, oh, you didn't do too great because you got a lot of leads there. You didn't convert that much. You know, your closing ratio was, you know, uh, 4%. 4%. It, could, it could be just, you know, something that really depends on your agency situation, what your marketing budget is, uh, what your skill level is. So I think a goal is something that's really too personal for me to just generalize. I think it's really up to your producer, your agency, and how many you know, big question is how much leads you're getting them to and the quality of leads as well. That makes sense. That's a very good answer. Um, what would you say is your employee turnover ratio right now? It's pretty good. You know, Wilbur, I think um, we touched on that a little bit, employee retention. It's really underrated, you know. Um, but right now I haven't lost, I, I lost one person this year, um, she kind of like more like a personal leave. So she did quit, but besides that, I can't really remember, you know, obviously I had a lot of people quit, you know, in the past, but I haven't had anybody quit. That was probably the first person. Um, well, I, I, I've, I've hired people too. I fired people too. So I think the key thing to think about there, be, be, instead of giving you guys numbers is, you know, when I fire somebody or when they quit, they're the type of people that I didn't mind quitting, you know? So that has probably, like someone I didn't want to quit, quitting hasn't happened for a long time. This one time this year, maybe it was the first time in like three years, probably. Uh, so if I fire them or they quit, that's kind of like, you know, I kind of wanted it that way. So the ones that are really, really valuable, that are really you know, moving the ball the right direction. Those are the ones I just reward like crazy. And I just really have the mentality that I work for them. You know, that's how important they are for me. And you can forget about it when it comes to the protege program. No freaking way. <laughs> you want the protege program. You want to keep all your staff, right? <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a good, obviously, you know, I'm always trying to get better. You know, at uh, not only giving them financial uh, incentives and goals, but also to um, make sure they're happy. 
you know a lot of them are moms um they need some flexibility in their lives and they, they have priorities in their lives and just being understanding and just being supportive in other ways besides just you know financial opportunity um just work atmosphere you know um but really i think that's i think a good general way to look at it is to imp improve employee retention shifting my mentality is you work for me you better do something then i work for you what can i do for you i think that's kind of in a short way uh, how to improve your employee retention. That makes sense. I'm getting a lot of follow-up questions on leads. Um, what, what would you say is the minimum amount of leads that you would give someone for a $10,000 in premium goal? So I guess how many leads would you would you be giving someone and you want them to be doing at least $10,000 a month in premium? Um, probably about uh, probably about at least five a day. Five a day for about $10,000 yeah. premium? Okay. Yeah, you really want to, and then that depends on that producer. If they don't, if that's their sole job, then you probably want to get at least 10 a day and then bump that expectation up to like 25,000. Okay. So if you have someone that's, their only job is to work leads, 10 leads a day, about $25,000 a month of premium is a very, um, I guess you'd say achievable goal. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. it takes work and development, but that's a goal that you feel that they can be held accountable to. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that uh, duty of like, if somebody has, to do leads, I think it's kind of good to let them focus on that rather than, hey, you also have to do customer service, which is still fine, which is still you're gonna have to do, but 80% of the time for a producer should be spent on sales and 20% of the time on customer service and really have, you know, really try to, you know, and it depends on the quality of leads too, because sometimes you get 10 leads and they're like, you know, eight wrong numbers. So you probably wanna be able to give them like ability to quote and talk to 10 people. That makes sense. And then are you using farmers, like farmers leads, like, like Everquote, all web leads, you know, all the farmers uh, partnerships or are you using your own outside companies or a mixture of both? A mixture of both. So, you know, all web leads is a, a lead company that I really, really built my agency off of the first 10 years. I was a big time spender with them, uh, but not so much anymore because I've generated different ways. And I feel like I don't want to just, you know, I don't want to get too deep into that because that's a little bit technical and this isn't a 12 hour meeting when it comes to generating right. your own leads. It's a lot of, um, you know, Zapier and a lot of like software, uh, you know, and um, commitment when it comes to um, money. And, uh, but that's how I started as internet leads. And I, you know, figured out, okay, how, what type of systems do I need to have to close these leads? Um, but I do think that you know, because I really want to help as much people as I can on this call. I do feel like social media is a big player. And I think that's something everybody could do because posting is free and just letting people know that you're working hard every day and then you're, you're, you could quote people and also getting into groups in your local communities or, you know, um, having podcasts and interviewing your top, you know, uh, entrepreneurs in your city who you actually want to ensure, <laughs> but you just say, Hey, join, um, you know, just social media in general, has been a game changer for me and just getting your staff involved or at least you involved and being really active on there only results to great things happening for your agency um, because that's just a great way for people to, you know, sometimes when it comes to leads and then when you do leads also, you want to have links to your social media too, because a lot of times when it comes to sales, you know, a lot of people are thinking like, who is this guy? So social media, you put yourself out there. There's a lot of videos of you. There's a lot of like, you know, content about you. Those type of things, I think, help people feel comfortable with you. And, um, you know, uh, people buy from people they know. And social media is a great way to get people to know that you're a professional insurance agent. We really have nothing to hide. So putting yourself out there is sometimes could be a challenge, but it's something I really highly recommend doing that in this day, uh, age because, you um, a lot of it is free. It's just, you know, work ethic and just going into right. groups and just chatting and just, you know, being, uh, when people think of insurance, you want to be front of mind with it a lot of, as much many people as possible. Oh, that makes sense. So I know, I know we're getting closer to, to uh, being out of time here, but I do want to ask you um, a question that I, I emailed you that I think you, you like the question. So what would you do right now to grow if you were a thousand PIF agency? So let's say Dan Kijima wakes up tomorrow. He's a thousand PIF book. What's the next thing he's going to do to grow his agency? Man, yeah, I thought that was a great question. I, I should have been prepared for it. <laughs> um, man, I think it's going to be either marketing or staffing. But I think I will go with marketing first. Okay, okay. because you can have the 
you could you could find the best recruit in the world, but if they don't have the marketing systems for them, that's a payroll expense. You know, so at that point, it's super important how you're spending your money. So I would be at that level, I I think I'll I will, I will still be spending my money and checking to see who's the best lead vendor is for, for me to see what niche is the best for me. You know, whether it be auto insurance, home insurance, life insurance, certain like line of commercial business, finding out what depends on the company's product to where we're competitive in and finding out this is what I really want to focus on. And once you find that certain niche, I will go hard on that niche and then become an expert at closing that certain type of policy with that certain lead vendor or just having a, a proven system. I'll try, I'll be really obsessed on finding that one thing that you could do. And and once you have that system, once you have a certain yeah, a system, I'll be developing a system basically. That's I think. And then you could find a producer and teach them. Since you mastered it already, I will teach them how to do that system and then keep that going on and on by just, you know, hopefully that marketing system is scalable, meaning that you can spend more money on it. Um, but finding a system that works, finding a niche that works, those are the type of activities I'll be doing um, because that's a difficult part of the agency journey, I feel like, is finding a lease source or vendor or flow that's consistent and is scalable. But I think once you find that, it solves a lot of problems. Because if you have an overflow of leads, you could, you know, even though this part's not easy, you could recruit, find people. But it's a lot easier to recruit people when you're saying, hey, I got a lot of leads. I need right. people to close them. So I think the number one thing at a 1,000 PIF level is to obviously uh, stay hungry, stay motivated, because uh, you got to keep writing or that book of business is going to get sh sh uh, smaller, um, is – invest money into finding out a marketing system that really, really works for you. And once you find it, really start scaling that. But finding it, I think it's still in that process because at a thousand PIF, you, you probably were able to build that off natural market and just pure hustle. But now I think it's all about finding a system and being able to uh, replicate and build a system up. Right, yeah, because at a thousand, like you said, you can build to a thousand a lot with natural market referrals and doing different things, but after a thousand to really break past that, you need to build a system that you can duplicate and scale and put staff members in there, right? Because a thousand, you, you uh, theoretically, you could do it all yourself, but it might take a little longer. But if you have a good system that you can replicate and scale, I think that would make the most sense to grow, grow past that plateau. Yep, absolutely. Um, and then so I'm getting another more questions about leads again. So yeah, yeah. Are, you, are you using passive leads or hot handoff leads? So live transfers or, or regular internet leads? Well, um, most of my leads are from just filling out forms. Okay. Yeah. So live transfer leads, I haven't had an experience in, but those are the best ones because, but I, what I try to do is get the regular leads and make them live transfers or make them direct calls. So I get the leads at a lower cost probably. And then I try to, you know, get them to call us. So the right. ultimate goal is like a live tr lead transfer, but I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to, gather the information first, have them fill out more simpler, shorter forms, and then follow up with them to try to get them to call us. So I do, you know, believe that getting them to call us is a holy grail when it comes to marketing for insurance. Okay, so you're generating your own live leads, which is kind of what I think you were, you were alluding to earlier with all the texts and the emails. You're trying to get them to call you, which makes it a much easier sale for, you know, your producers. It's a much easier mindset. It's not as much chasing. It's more you know, handling things that are coming in balance, so a higher close rate, that, that, that all makes sense. Um, and then someone asked a question. I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to the question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway. So are all your calls uh, on the phone or, or do you do in-office appointments? Or are you yeah. on the phone or office? Uh, most of it is over the phone, you know. Um, I mean, with COVID and everything last year too, I think. Um, and then it's, it's just, you know, where we live. Um, people just don't want to drive. <laughs> to get an insurance quote, you know, I think it's just not what we want. We, I'd rather have people come into the office and, you know, do full on FFRs and, you know, sell them BULs and stuff like that because they have t time to talk about that. But it's just kind of like what they want these days is people, man, besides price, the next thing they value is convenience and time. 
you know, so um, it's just something that we have to, we emphasize too with our copy. Hey, we make it, you know, convenient for you, make it easy for you. Um, those are the type of things that uh, people respond to because, you know, price is a price, right? But great right. customer service, uh, efficient, you know, uh, easy process. Those are the type of things that people value these days. So um, I, although we could wish certain things, the market kind of decides how we do business these days and uh, people value their time and they value convenience. So that's kind of what we uh, try to provide to them. Awesome, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Really appreciate you coming and speaking to the agents. Uh, I know we've, we've had some, some, a lot more questions that we didn't get a chance to ask, but I know we, we I know we, you took a lot of time out of, out of your busy day. So I'm going to respect your time. I know we had, we had set for an hour. So I just want to say thank you. We you know, really appreciate your time. I, I, I know I learned a lot from, from you, just kind of learning about your philosophy and how you run your agency. So I'm sure our agents learned a lot, a lot of that as well. So again, thank you so much for your time. Um, appreciate your help and support. Does there, if there's ever anything that we can do for you, feel free to reach out before and have to do anything we can for you as well. But just want to say thank you. No, yeah, Wilbur, thanks for having me. I, I really do generally wish the best for everybody out there. I know it's not easy um, at times or at all times, maybe. <laughs> uh but you know just trust in this trust in the process i think the renewals definitely does pay off so sometimes you feel like man i'm not getting anywhere as long as your book of business is growing you're headed the right direction and you know spending that money i think having the courage to do that i think is a key theme too so i really enjoy talking to you guys that hour really flew by it really <laughs> did. Me. It so, really did. um but yeah uh we'll definitely keep in touch if anybody um yeah, uh, same same thing to you, Wilbur. You know, if you need anything, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to keep working with you in the future too. So uh, best luck to you, your uh, district and everybody, all the agents that uh, tuned in today. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. We'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks again. See you guys. See you.